Just one more legislative day till crossover day on Monday, and the heat is on under the Gold Dome. We've got eyes on bills pertaining to packing heat and whether tasers are an acceptable alternative. And killed in the line of duty. When fallen police officers and firefighters leave children behind, should the state step up with scholarships? Lawmaker starts right now. Welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. It's day 28 of the 2016 session, and we're steaming full ahead to crossover day, which is next Monday. Shelby Lynn is down at the Capitol, and she has all the latest developments in her report from under the gold dome. Hi, Shelby. That's right, Bill. The clock is ticking as the crossover day deadline looms over the General Assembly. Lawmakers have just a couple days to get their legislation to the floor for a vote. As we told you last night, we're watching a fireworks bill that's been making its way through the House. It would place restrictions on fireworks in Georgia. Right now, under current Georgia law, people can set off fireworks any day of the week between 10 a.m. and midnight. But on holidays, the 3rd and 4th of July and on December 31st and New Year's Day, it's even later until 2 a.m., under a bill making its way through the House, HB 727 would restrict where and when people can use fireworks. What I wanted to do is I want to keep fireworks legal. I want people to be able to celebrate the holidays, but I want to see some local control. I want to see our communities be able to uh, put some reasonable time, place and manner restrictions on where fireworks can be used, what time fireworks can be used. Representative Alex Atwood, a Republican from St. Simons Island, had a fireworks restriction bill too, but he merged it with Representative Paul Battle's bill because he says the bills were essentially the same. Battle's bill would add a whole list of places that would be off limits to pyrotechnic displays, including hospitals, city and county property, electric plants, and water treatment facilities. It would also give local governments the ability to control when fireworks can be used. What we want to be able to do is say, uh, okay, uh, under these parameters, you do have the authority to move in and to control what's going on in your local community. They're not going to be outlawed. That won't happen. But, for example, we shouldn't be exploding fireworks at 3 in the morning. But when the ball drops on New Year's Eve and my folks over on Sea Island and Brunswick and Jekyll Island want to have a good time and, and have, uh, have a little bit of a celebration, I think they should be allowed to. Atwood says the issue of shooting fireworks off almost any time of day or night can be a big problem along the coast, where vacationers and tourists are on a different time schedule than local residents. I had citizens complaining that folks celebrating on the beach were uh, exploding fireworks at 3 in the morning. Well, that's not a good thing. I mean, we want to have fun and we want to keep it safe. Battle's fireworks bill was voted out of the Regulated Industries House Committee this week. It needs to reach the House floor for a vote before the end of crossover day on Monday. An update on another story we're following, Representative Alan Peake's medical marijuana expansion bill. It was voted out of committee yesterday and now goes to House rules. Lawmakers gutted the bill, removing the part that allowed for pot growing operations in Georgia. But Peake says the bill is a step forward anyway. While this is being done in 40 other states across the country, uh, in some form or fashion, um, it may take us, it may take another year till we get to the point where we can um, set up a regulatory structure that does provide for access here in Georgia, which is at the end of the day, that's the ultimate solution. But we have expanded the list of conditions that people can participate. We have provided some immunity for shippers that may be willing to transport the product here to Georgia. And quite frankly, what needs to be happen is Congress needs to act. But until Congress acts, it's up to us at the state level to come up with a solution that works for our citizens. A moment of silence in the House today to pay tribute to Representative Bob Bryant of Garden City. Bryant died overnight at a hospital in Savannah after a brief illness. Bob was my friend. He was all of our friends. You know, we often talk about how being in this body is like having an extended family. You know, we rejoice together and we grieve together. And today we're hurting together. 
The 71-year-old Bryant was first elected to office in 2004. He was an Army veteran and was active in local politics. But he recently told friends he would not seek re-election because he wanted to spend more time with his family. And more than anything, Bob believed in this place. He believed in the, the credibility of the House. He believed in the nobility of service. And he believed in the spirit that rests in every one of these members. As a member of the minority party, Bob made me understand that minority is simply a position. It is not a reflection of power. It is about who we are and whose we are. And today we are all friends of Bob Bryant. Funeral services for Representative Bryant are pending. And Bill, after that tribute, lawmakers got back to a hectic day at work getting ready for crossover day. That's the last day legislation can pass from its chamber of origin. We're going to have more on that for you tomorrow. That's it from the Capitol. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Shelby. All right, we have a lot to get to as we approach crossover day down at the Capitol. So joining me here in the studio, Representative Keisha Waits. She's a Democrat from Atlanta. And Leo Smith, he's the director of minority engagement with the Georgia Republican Party. Thank you both very much for being here. Um, Keisha Waits, one of the reasons that we were looking forward to talking to you is that as the campus carry bill uh, moves forward, it's already passed by a pretty big vote in the House and is now over in the Senate. You've been involved in a couple of measures that are important to you in relation to that. Mm -hmm. One of them is that you believe that if students are going to carry guns on campus, they need training. Talk about your measure. Well, absolutely. I think given the demographic, I think given the fact that there are huge amounts of alcohol on college campuses uh, and that individuals tend to not have the best judgment, it is our belief that if young people are going to carry concealed weapons on college campuses, that we should at least offer some type of basic training uh, so that we will protect the public interests are good of all the students who are at the campus. And, and just to be clear, uh, although you're applying it to, to campus carry, mm -hmm. Philosophically, do you think that anybody who wants to carry a gun in Georgia ought to have training before they can get a license? Absolutely. I actually proposed a measure to that effect. Uh, didn't really get a lot of ground, didn't get a committee hearing, and as you are aware and you know you, and indicated that crossover day is on Monday. And so the clock is pretty much running out. But yes, I do support the measure of requiring individuals who are going to carry concealed weapons to have some form of training. Okay, so the, the campus carry measure, the training for students who want to carry weapons, you're, you're not getting very far with that. Well, I mean, uh, the, the bill has passed. Uh, the decision has been made. And, and certainly I want to... Uh, no, I mean your measure to require training. No, no, is... We did not get a committee here. And, and certainly I was disappointed <clears throat> about that. Uh, the session's been moving rapidly, uh, I think, given that it's an election year, if you will. So it did not. And I'm certainly disappointed by that. Uh, it is my hope that in the future we will visit this. And I think now that we have uh, guns on college campuses and that, that at least pass out of the House, that we will consider that measure. Um, Leo, um, your... your you're very active on the political side of of, uh, of what happens down at the legislative session. Right. Um, you got a you've got a legislature dominated by Republicans, and it is. But but expanding gun rights isn't a necessarily a partisan issue. Yet it's one that's identified closely with typically Republicans. It, 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 that's just the right place to be if you're a Republican in terms of the voters you're going to face next fall. Uh, it may be. I think uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, Killer Mike, Mike Rinder, would probably disagree a little bit. Cause but but these they, House <laughs> members are going to, and Senate, senators right. are going to have to run for re-election. Are they going to get very far if they support anything that they think restricts access to guns? I think that they're going to be very cautious about even discussing restricted access. And I think that's what their voters want them to do. The Georgia voters want to make sure their Second Amendment rights are free and clear. And any restriction has to be argued for a pretty considerable time. So I think with this uh, legislation um, that I think is welcomed in, in, in presentation because it's important that people know how to properly use guns. And I think that, that, that the Georgia legislators, Republican and Democrat, believe in training and believe in Safety but, but they're not supporting your bill. I mean, they don't want any restrictions. But I think that might be a practical and procedural matter in that this is the first discussion of that particular issue of training that they've had on, uh, on, on issues of guns. Okay. 
Um, what's your? I beg to differ on that. On, on okay. House Bill 60, if you recall, we actually mm -hmm. introduced it as an amendment during that debate, uh, I think in 2014, and it, it didn't seem to get any traction at that time. But I do want to point out the fact that I, I'm very respectful of the authors of this legislation. I think that they speak to a specific need of that constituency. So I, I don't well, want that to Well, that was my question, yeah. You know, the hard work that's been done on that legislation. I just simply speak to the constituents in my community and the parents and the many college professors and administrators that I heard from that specifically indicated that they weighed in and they were not supportive of the bill. All right, so I want to ask you a question that I acknowledge comes sort of out of left field, and, and I'm not sure there is a correct answer okay. for this question, so bear with me. So campus carry passed by a big margin in the House. It's, a, it's the sort of measure generally supported by conservatives. Everyone would agree that the Senate is every bit, if not more conservative than the House. I agree. And yet, the Senate may in fact slow down campus carry. They don't seem to be as enthusiastic about the measure over there as they are in the House. And yet these are the same senators who are very gung-ho about all the religious liberty measures that they're sending over to the House. That feels to me like a strange juxtaposition. Does that make sense, what I'm asking? Well, I think what you're seeing is the juggling of priorities. I mean, right now, religious liberty has been technically, in a way, a hotter issue than campus carry. And I really think that it's just a matter of what bandwidth people have to, to deal with the issues of the day. But I think we also take enough to do no harm. And I think the reality is that we all have the same interest in terms of protecting our young people and keeping them safe. No one disagrees with the fact that on our campuses here in Metro Atlanta and around the state, we've had some challenges. We all want to see something happen. But my feeling was that we took a sledgehammer versus a scalpel in terms of making our decisions. And so I would simply like to see, given that it has passed, and so we won't fight that fight again. But I think that we have to look at how we can potentially perfect that legislation to make it better. So let's talk about another bill that relates to campus carry. Yes. Uh, there's now a measure that would uh, offer in the House an alternative to gun carry. The campus carry has passed, let's be clear on that. But there's now a bill which would authorize the use of tasers on college campuses, presumably as an alternative to carrying a pistol, say. That measure uh, passed out of committee, and right. that measure is also passed in the House. Uh, again, uh, I, 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 here's the thing. When you're using a taser or a stun gun, I, the... the, 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 the the potential for a fatality is not necessarily there. So I, that's not something that I'm really going to push back about. I saw it as a, a reasonable alternative to a handgun. And so for me, it wasn't something that I necessarily opposed, but I would like to see some type of training in place, given, again, the fact that on college campuses, young people tend to use alcohol and, and, and not necessarily exercise the best judgment. Uh, but again, I see it as a reasonable uh, uh, compromise versus having a weapon on hand. So, uh, Leo, just another measure of protection for all those 21 and older students, because it does apply only to 21-year-olds, the, ca the campus carry measure, uh, to uh, protect themselves. Well, it's, and I think that we may be reading a little bit too much into the idea that only fear in the need for self-protection is the the cause for this this bill is not that it's, it's simple also to assert the First Amendment rights of people who are 21 years old and, and I think that's just as important in this discussion as anything else there's also the issue of choice of the schools um, if a school uh, decides that they want to create a certain sort of environment for their students to, to even give them a differential advantage over other students the free market should allow someone to say I want to design my campus this way versus that way and those schools should be able to make that decision for themselves but the uh, campus carry bill says it's going to be allowed across Absolutely. across college campuses. I, I think that was brilliant what you said I think that's, a, again, a great compromise <laughs> but, is to allow and, each and, school to make that decision. And so you pass, a, you, pass the, you pass the bill as it's been done now, and now you can start to shape it. I mean, I think Nancy Pelosi says, let's pass the law of Obamacare, and then we can start to shape it. Well, this is the same thing. So Leo Smith is offering a brand new idea for how you could, you could put this. I, I wish you were there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday I'll run for office. There you Absolutely. go. Let, let's be, well, you know, Leo, here's what's interesting about Leo Smith. Leo it has been uh, widely praised 
for the outreach he's done as, a, as an African-American Republican mm -hmm. to the African-American <laughs> community, trying to bring uh, black Georgians into the Republican Party. It strikes me these are exactly the kind of positions that you need to represent if you're going to expand that African-American base. Is that fair to say? Well, I mean, thank you, Bill. And that was very kind in the way that you approached that. But, you know, really, this is about finding good solutions. In the few minutes that Representative Waits and I sat in the waiting room, we, because we have discussions across perspective, we were able to come to some solutions that probably weren't oftentimes approached. It's discussion and robust debate that we need to have. And that's what inclusion is all about. It's not just about numbers and quotas, it's about ideas as well. Let, let's close out uh, this portion of the conversation. We've, we've talked about it on the show before, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, the campus carry bill, uh, of course, has no fiscal note attached to it. And yet, uh, there's a lot of, because the critics of the measure are worried about what costs this might impose on colleges and universities in Georgia. One thing is that um, students will not be allowed to bring weapons into dorms, fraternities, mm -hmm. or sororities. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, the, the proponents say, well, that's fine because if you're over 21, you're probably not living in university housing, but, but maybe you are, mm -hmm. which means the university is going to have to come up with a system for providing some sort of lock boxes, mm -hmm. maybe increase the security staffs. Are you worried about the costs? Well, certainly. I, uh, I wrote an op-ed to that effect where we talked about the potential uh, for tuition hikes, uh, given the need for an increased security, given the potential to retrofit the college. And we talked about this in the committee. Uh, I don't know what those challenges are, but I can tell you that I have seen numbers in terms of Texas being at 47 million, uh, as, other, as well as other states such as Arizona, who've had some of these costs involved in terms of retrofitting their campuses. So I think to say that there's not going to be a cost, I think that's ridiculous. But nonetheless, well, uh, I, again, I want to be respectful to the authors of the bill. I know they worked very, very hard on it. I respect Chairman Powell. I sat on that committee. And uh, again, even though we don't necessarily agree, we agree that we needed to find some solution. We, we do know that the Board of Regents, which last year fought this measure very openly, seems to this year have decided to take a much more low-key approach. They don't like this measure, and they are certain to have their feelings felt on the Senate side, don't you imagine? I would certainly think that uh, given the number of students that are impacted, the teachers, the administrators, the parents, and stakeholders involved, certainly I, I would think that they will win. Well, we'll, we'll watch it. I mean, if, if, there's, if there are equestrian stables at University of Georgia, the students who bring their horses have to pay for boarding. And so, you know, this is actually an opportunity for schools to pad their revenue generation. So, I mean, you know, the students who want to bring a gun on campus can pay for the storage. Uh -oh. Well, but, but again, I, I, what I am concerned about is, is the, the potential for tuition hikes given the cost of higher education today. So we don't want to pass that cost on to students unnecessarily. Yeah, well, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think we should assume that a school's responsibility is to attend to every need that a child brings to the campus. That the school doesn't have that responsibility. Of keeping uh, the student The safe. student who provides, who decides to go to the school, if they have to store their equipment, their gear, they can pay for that themselves. I mean, we shouldn't look for ways to grow the, uh, the number of ways that we use tax dollars for the benefit of the person making a choice. Um, sometimes a person's choices should be paid for by them and not I by the institution. I absolutely agree with you 100%. If you going to bear that cost. I think that that cost should not be passed on to those ones who right. do choose not to make that decision. So Too late to add that amendment, I Keisha know. Waits. Right. <laughs> That's tough. Sorry, right, we'll get there next time. We will uh, get there today. I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break in a minute here. Um, and when we come back, um, I'd like to talk about a measure that you uh, feel very strongly about, as well as talk about the presidential race, which is coming at us here in Georgia. So coming up on lawmakers killed in the line of duty. When police officers and firefighters give their lives, the question is, should the state step in and help their children attend college? We'll talk about the scholarship proposal. But first, another round of Know Your Lawmakers. Senator Gail Davenport is a Democrat representing District 44. She was sworn in to the General Assembly in 2007. As a young girl, she took part in modeling and pageants and was the first African-American to be selected as a princess at the Atlanta Dogwood Festival. 
Since then, she's been on hand at the crowning of presidential nominees as a four-time delegate at the Democratic National Convention. More recently, Davenport has turned her civic spirit into action on a mission trip to Haiti. More lawmakers in a moment. On the season finale of Doc Martin. What date is that? Dinner with Martin. No, so not a date now. Martin and Louisa make a big decision. We've decided not to continue with therapy. Well, good luck. I don't think we'll need luck. I think you might. And when a patient insists on Martin's help. A doctor isn't a wizard. I just weed my hands and cure everyone. It may be the last house call he ever makes. <laughs> Doc Martin. Tonight at night on GPB. George's first abortion law was signed on this date, February 25th, in 1876. It defined feticide as a criminal act and laid out punishments. The law did grant exemptions when the life of the mother was at stake. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm here tonight with Representative Keisha Waits of Atlanta and with Leo Smith, the Director of Minority Engagement with the Georgia Republican Party. I have to say, when uh, show writer Lisa Clark uh, gave us that script about when the first abortion law was passed in Georgia, I was pretty stunned that it was back in the 1850s. That was really a very interesting uh, statistic for me to look at. Uh, Keisha Waits, you, uh, HB 54 yes. is your bill, which would provide scholarships, right? You correct me if I'm wrong to the uh, children of fallen law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, officers and firefighters. Tell us about that. Absolutely, public safety officials as well. Um, yes, it's something that's very close and dear to my heart. I had a uh, former uh, classmate who lost her husband uh, in a helicopter crash with the Atlanta Police Department. And she reached out and showed me some data reflecting what other states were doing in terms of widows uh, and children and families who had lost a loved one, obviously who were killed in the line of duty and or disabled. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my thought process was, I think I thought it was a great idea to do something in Georgia. We currently have this legislation. Uh, the first part of money is a line item in the budget, which was 400,000. I had been increased to $600,000 in 2015, we we had 27 applicants for this scholarship. Wow. Only seven were served. And so clearly there is a need to increase the uh, revenue streams for this particular part of money. So we have a tax donation uh, on the tax return or on the driver's license in which it doesn't cost taxpayers a dime. So it's a compassion bill, uh, a love and compassion bill that I think will support uh, the families who've made the ultimate sacrifice. And so I'm hoping to get favorable support. HB 54 passed out of higher education committee, is that right? It so it's sitting in rules it right is. now, and you are fast approaching yes. day 30, yes. after which you gotta get it on the, on the floor before yes. midnight on right. next Monday. What are your chances? Well, I don't know. You know, I've, I've taken the opportunity to follow the process. I've met with the chairman of Bruce. I've had conversations uh, with a number of legislators and leadership, and we're simply hopeful and prayerful. Uh, we have the support of the Georgia Sheriff's Association, the Georgia uh, Chief of Police Association, uh, the Fire Chiefs Association. And so we have all of the support from the public and safety officials, uh, certainly a fiscal note. Uh, was ordered as well on the bill, which again, it wouldn't cost taxpayers because this is a voluntary donation. So I certainly hope that Leo, you will call in your resources uh, <laughs> and help us out in that measure. Uh, but again, I want to thank uh, Democratic leadership as well as Republican leadership. Uh, Chairman Powell is a number two signer on this bill. And so it's something that's very dear and close to me. Well, we will watch. I, I'll tell you what, on Monday night, we'll keep an eye well, on let's HB Well, wait a minute, 54. I have tomorrow. I have tomorrow, I have Thursday, I have Friday. <laughs> All right. But we'll watch to see if it comes out on the Absolutely. floor and you get a vote um, on that one. Leo Smith, let's talk a little about presidential politics. Uh, as we said before, you're very uh, energetically engaged in trying to encourage uh, African Americans in Georgia to think twice and, and become more involved in the Republican Party. It, it increasingly appears in polling that Donald Trump will win the Georgia primary, possibly by a fairly significant margin. And although anything can happen, he's well on his way to winning the Republican nomination. What do you think, what's that message uh, saying to the African Americans in Georgia you'd like to recruit? Are they ready for a Donald Trump 
Well, I, I certainly think they are. I, I think that African Americans who are very familiar with the art known as jazz can improvise with pretty much anything that is delivered <laughs> from the White House. So, so, and we have for a very long time and many generations um, been at the bequest of whomever's there. And we've had to live under those circumstances. Donald Trump it has a pretty known presence with us through entertainment and media. Um, Russell Simmons is a big friend of his, was a good friend of his. Jay-Z, all those guys are great friends of Donald Trump. So he's not unfamiliar to the black community. Now, the question is, do they believe that the bravado and some of the rhetoric that that is part of political campaigning and also laced in with entertainment that Donald Trump brings to this thing, um, do they believe that he's being serious or do they believe that he's just being Donald having fun cutting the jab at the table, you know, kind of thing. I think the latter. I think they think that Donald is a good guy. We, we should, I, I want to be careful. We know that black voters, like every other voting group, is not a, necessarily a monolithic group. Right. So I want to be sure That's that right. I, I say that. Yeah. Um, but it does strike me that his message doesn't seem to reson have the same resonance in the black community that it would, uh, that it does among the whites who are supporting him right now. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, well, certainly he speaks uh, to uh, the thoughts of many. I think that's a fair statement. Uh, I think many of the inflammatory statements, however, can't be dismissed. I think when you make comments regarding Latinos being rapists and pedophiles, I think that as a minority community- Mexicans, right. Well, okay. Undocumented. That's, well, that's I just exactly want to be sure. That's exactly the way Let's be clear right. about it. Okay, right. very good. Thank <clears throat> you for the correction. But, but nonetheless, I don't necessarily believe that that's something that resonated with black people. I think that many found that offensive as I did as a black mm -hmm. woman. And so, uh, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, he's had some successes in his life and uh, he certainly speaks to a need and a void uh, in electorate politics. Yes. Uh, but I don't think he necessarily speaks to the needs of my community specifically. Leo, do you, let's ask it, let me ask it a different way. Um, you have been working hard to increase uh, uh, black turnout uh, and, and participation. Do you think the Republican field right now is in incentivizing African Americans to take Republican ballots when they go to the polls next Tuesday? Or is it more likely that Hillary Clinton, who has been a friend to the black community for many years, is going to win most of those people's votes? Well, I think right now it's, we have to deal with the reality of the political process we're in. And, and one on the Republican side, our primary voters are largely and majorly white. And so therefore there has not been a whole lot of shaping policy and discussion and process to engaging black communities. Um, whereas you see Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, you see them doing a lot of uh, talk with black communities, getting black endorsements, et cetera, that sort of thing. So for us, our work can Continues. Our work to engage African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, all people to look at free market solutions, to look at limited government, to look at compassionate conservatism as opposed to big government spending for, for the needs of society. We continue to do that work. Doesn't help your cause when Ben Carson says, well, I don't think President Obama had a real black experience. Well, he said a comment in that that was an academic comment that is part of the discussion of called race essentialism, which Cornell West wrote an entire book called mm -hmm. Race Matters. Yeah. That that delves that subject. So this is an anthropo anthropological discussion that deals with social issues that even academics like Bernie Sanders supporter Cornel West believes. He doesn't believe that, 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 that Barack Obama shares the black inherited slave experience that most black Americans experience. Here's what's fascinating about that, uh, Keisha. Um, that's a really interesting, deep conversation doesn't fit very well on a bumper sticker right. in a presidential <laughs> election year. I, I, wanna, I just want to point out something. You know, legislation is either going to be good or bad. It's not necessarily black or white. It's either effective or it's ineffective. And so I think that that's pretty much where he and I may meet somewhere in the yeah. middle on those yeah. issues. Okay. Is that is, it works or it doesn't? Real quick, you haven't made a, an endorsement. You're still looking <laughs> at Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders and saying, hmm. Well, well let, me, let me be very honest with you. Uh, the thought of electing the first woman president certainly excites me as a woman. Uh, just as electing the first African-American excited me uh, in 2008. Uh, but I want to support the Democratic nominee. I think that Democratic values speak very clearly and resonate with me, my constituents, and the people that I serve, although we have uh, both uh, 
uh, party politics in the district. But nonetheless, I have made a decision to not get involved in the primaries All and right. to support the nominee. All right. But yes, the, the first woman president certainly excites me. All right. And Bill, real, real quick. You real got 10 quick. seconds. I was at a meeting downtown, mostly African American. Someone said, we need to make sure that the next mayor of Atlanta is a black mayor. And someone stood up who was black who said, we need to make sure the next mayor of Atlanta is a good mayor. I think America wants a good president. Perfect way to end the conversation. Absolutely. Leo Smith. Uh, Representative Keisha Wades, thank you both so much for being with me tonight. Yes. There you have it. Put day 28 in the books. Just a dozen legislative days yet left. For lots more, you can track us on Facebook and Twitter at GPB News or our website, gpb.org slash lawmakers. Don't forget, Political Rewind will be on the air tomorrow at 3 on GPB Radio around the state. Boy, do we have a lot to talk about tomorrow. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll be back here Monday for Crossover Day coverage. I'm Bill Nygut. Good night.